you're fulfilling your true purpose if you commit your life to the highest advantage of others. I wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad because I'm serving a mission to serve my fellow human being. Because the school system will never teach you about money. They teach people to be poor. Poor people say, I can't afford it, I can't do that, I don't have time, because this is an escape. The reason they're poor is they haven't failed. It's that fear mentality. You play it safe and you don't introduce new risks into your life. We gotta change what we teach our kids. And introduce a real different mindset. How can I afford it? How can I do that? A question opens a mind, a statement closes the mind. One of the greatest ways to acquire great wealth is playing Monopoly in real life. So my game financially is business, number one. Second is real estate. And that's why I pay no taxes. My success comes from spirituality, not finance. Every time I failed, it was like, hey, what have I learned? I grow from it. We have a mission to do. You do not belong to you. You belong to the universe. What does God want done that I might be able to lend a hand at doing? I don't think God likes people being poor. They say that the human race is doomed, that we have lost touch with our true nature, that the media has corrupted us, and that the planet has no future. I disagree. I believe that humanity is full of hope and that our salvation lies within each one of us. My name is Brian Rose, and my job is to listen, the oldest method of learning known to man. Each week I seek out individuals that are changing the world, people who are living and thinking in a different way. Their stories will challenge your beliefs, make you question your choices, and perhaps inspire you to change. I never planned on doing any of this, but now I can't stop. Join me on this mission and make humanity something we can all be proud of. I am super excited to share this conversation with Robert Kiyosaki. I first had the chance to speak with him over five years ago before we had any of this studio. And now I got to go to Phoenix, Arizona to speak with this legend. He's the author of Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is the number one selling personal finance book of all time, over 30 million copies. And Robert has been there and done that. He started companies, built real estate empires, and taught people how to have a rich mentality. And that's the thing about Robert. He had two dads when he was a kid. One was his natural dad, one was his best friend's dad, and one had a poor mentality and one had a rich mentality. A poor person says, how can I afford that? The rich person actually goes out and says, what can I do to make this a great investment? And so that's what I love about Robert. He always looks at things in a great perspective. We had a great talk about his career, his wife, his time in Vietnam, and what it's like to really understand business today. And I know you're going to love it. But what I was really excited to do was help him launch America's first weekly cash flow summit. And this is a brand new way of making money. As a former Wall Street banker, I was super excited to share this type of investment strategy with the public for the very first time. You see, this is something we used to do in the banking industry all the time. And of course, as host of the event, I was able to secure exclusive rights to offer you a space to the summit, but this will not be available for very long. So if you wanna see what I was doing with Robert in Arizona, click on the link below or go to londonreal.tv forward slash cash flow and secure your spot and I will see you on the inside for the summit. London Real doesn't stop when the conversation ends. You see, that's when we get started. Because everything begins with a thought and then comes the action. The London Real Academy is our global transformation platform. Here we bring together thousands of students from over 75 countries. Whether you want to build a profitable business from your passion, or learn to speak to inspire, or broadcast yourself with your very own podcast, 
or accelerate your life to become a high performance person, we have the online accountability course and personal mentoring program that will make your dream a reality. Join us and we'll take your life to the next level together. Our next accelerator course is starting soon. This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Robert Kiyosaki, the entrepreneur, educator, and investor, best known as the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the number one personal finance book of all time. You've challenged and changed the way tens of millions of people around the world think about money, and you become a passionate and outspoken advocate for financial education. I'm here on location with you in Scottsdale, Arizona. Robert, welcome back to London Real. Well, thank you. I enjoyed our last interview. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's been a great day here, and yesterday as well, spending time with you. Yesterday was one of the highlights of my life, so it was fantastic. Well, it was you and, and, and me and Jim Rickards. Jim and why was that the highlight of your life? What was happening that day that made you feel that way? Well, you ever seen a kid, you know, like they're playing football or baseball, whatever the sport is, and they, they go on to the field and they meet their hero. You know, this, they'd be like meeting David Beckham or, uh, you know, somebody like that. Well, to me, Jim Rickards and Noemi Prince and... Uh, a lot of the people I run around with now were my heroes. I mean, they were the guys on the field. And I said, you know, God, they're, they're so smart. They're insiders into this world. And so to actually be sitting next to Jim and working on projects together and I'm going, why am I here? So that would be like, you know, David Beckham and I playing soccer together. I mean, it's not supposed to be possible. You know? So hanging out with Jim Records and know me and you and it's like it's not supposed to be it's impossible but dreams do come true because you always thought you were the outsider and now you're hanging out with the quote-unquote insiders and you're agreeing on everything with them correct correct and um a lot of people get financial advice from outsiders if you know maybe a financial planner or a stockbroker or a real estate broker but they're not on the inside of the deal. And one of the reasons I like being an entrepreneur and being a real estate guy is I'm always trading from the inside. I know the deal, I'm part of the deal, I am the deal, you know? But the average person who buys like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, and saves money, they're outsiders. They have no idea what's going on between them and the real world of insight. So Jim Records and Naomi Prince, they were you know, Jim was with the CIA, long-term capital management, the Pentagon, and then the inside and what's going on with money. Nomi Prince was with Solomon and Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, they're insiders. And I was this little guy on the outside trying to figure out what are those guys doing? You know, how, how are the, it's almost like, what's the wizard doing? You know, how is the wizard pulling these handles and all this? And we're all outside jumping around doing as they tell us, you know, you should save money. Okay, I'll save money. You should buy stocks. Okay, I'll buy stocks. You should put some money in bonds. Okay, I'll buy. And I said, there's a wizard in there. I want to know who that wizard is. And so Jim and these guys are as close to the wizard as I could get. <laughs> How does a nine-year-old kid in Hawaii, a poor kid, get to this point? Yeah. Well, I wasn't poor by most people's standards but I came from a family with a poor attitude, if you know what I mean, because rich, poor, middle-class poverty starts with a fundamental attitude. So I was in Hawaii, I was nine years old. Uh, My father was the head of education, you know, PhD, very smart man, good guy. And for some reason, we moved across town and I went to a school with rich kids. So this is a little town called Hilo, Hawaii, you know, it's not on the map anywhere, but it is. It's a sugar plantation town. So when I was nine years old, I moved to this rich kid's school. And suddenly I realized I was poor because it's relative, you know, as I said, it's all relative. And my classmates were mostly white guys. And I was one of the few Asians in the class. And these guys, their fathers owned the banks, they owned the plantations, they owned the car dealerships, they owned the meat packing company, they own the ranches. And I'm going, how come my dad doesn't own that? 
So I remember raising my hand when I was nine years old, talking to my, ninth, my fourth grade teacher, and I said, you know, when am I going to learn about money? And she was this woman who should have retired 50 years earlier. <laughs> she was so sick and tired of kids by this time. She says, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I said, what am I in Sunday school? And I was this punky little nine-year-old kid. And she says, we don't teach money at school. I said, why not? And she couldn't answer me. And she got very flustered. She said, sit down, take your seat. And then I got curious. I said, why don't we learn about money? She says, go ask your father. He's, the, he's my boss. So my father was the head of education, PhD, all that stuff. I go home and ask him. I said, why don't we learn about money in school? And he looked at me and says, because the government doesn't let us teach that subject. The government tells us what we can teach and what we can't teach. And I thought that was strange. And I said, but aren't we going to school to learn about money? He says, no, your job is to get a job. I said, but you get a job to earn money. He goes, no, you're supposed to just get a job. I went, no, 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 no. Isn't the purpose of a job to earn money? He goes, you're correct. I said, so why don't I just learn about money? I can skip the job part, you know? And he got flustered and he said, look, and my father was, for Japanese, very tall, six foot four, and an imposing man, good guy. But he says, if you want to learn about money, why don't you ask your best friend's father about money? And I said, why? That's Mike. So I ask him. He says, because Mike's father is an entrepreneur. And I said, what, am, what are you? He says, I'm an employee. I'm a government employee. And I went, oh, what's the difference? He says, the difference is an entrepreneur must know about money, or they're, they're no longer entrepreneurs. And he says, an employee doesn't have to know anything about money, because the government will take care of them, the company will take care of them. So I'm kid, I'm all confused. But I took my dad's advice, and I trundled over to Mike's father's office and knocked on his door and I said, hey, I'm here, nine years old, teach me about money. He says, beat it, kid, you know. But that's where the story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad started. And finally, through persistence, my rich dad started teaching me about money on one condition. And that condition was he would never pay me. He says, the moment I pay you, you think like an employee. He says, that's the trap. Entrepreneurs work for free. And now I'm nine years old, my head's going cracking in half. He says, you never want a paycheck. You understand that, kid? I said, okay, I got it. And he says, well, how do I make money? He says, that's what entrepreneurs figure out. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the, it's the cat, you know, which just comes first, the cat or the, you know, the, the cat chasing its tail. And I said, so how do I learn about money? So he would just break out a Monopoly game board. So I would work for free, I'd pick up cigarette butts and, he had hotels and restaurants, and I would clean and do menial tasks. And as I got older, I started getting into office work and marketing and accounting, and I was an apprentice, basically. But I always worked for free. And he would teach me about money. But the way he taught me about money was playing Monopoly. And I finally, one day, I got upset. I said, well, when are you going to teach me about money? He says, what do you think we're doing? <laughs> we're playing Monopoly. He goes, no, 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 no. What do you think we're doing? We're playing Monopoly. He says, what do you think we're doing? So I don't know. I'm teaching about money. And then that's why, you know, you have one greenhouse. You know, he says, there's many formulas for great success in money. There's thousands of them. But one of the best ones is found on the game of Monopoly. It still is today. Four greenhouses, one red hotel. Mm -hmm. I said, what? He says, one of the greatest ways to acquire great wealth is playing Monopoly in real life. Four greenhouses, one red hotel. Well, is that all there is? He goes, that's it. And he says, what do you think I'm doing? And I went, I don't know. So then he took me out and he showed me his greenhouses. And 10 years later, when I was 19, I was now in school in New York, and I come back to Hawaii, and Rich Dad had bought the biggest piece of land smack dab in the middle of Waikiki Beach. And when you go to Waikiki Beach today, you'll see the Hyatt Regency Hotel. That was his hotel. Just like the game of Monopoly. Just like the game of Monopoly. Acquired assets and they became bigger assets. 
he just kept a, 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 what's called an assemblage because that property wasn't that big at that time. So he had to buy out all the small guys because Waikiki was a little dirt water little town. So he'd buy out this shop owner and buy that shop owner. And it took him a while, but he finally assembled this large piece of property. And then he, then he and Hyatt put up this giant hotel. Mm. You know, it I, just, and it just sold for $800 million. So that's how I learned about money. And that's because he refused, he refused to accept a paycheck. He says, that the moment you accept the paycheck, your brain goes dead. You know, he just bought, he just got paid. He says, as long as you're hungry, you'll think. And he was a great, great teacher. So today when people ask me what I do, they, they know me as the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I just say, I play Monopoly. So I own greenhouses, I own big hotels, I own oil wells, golf courses, businesses. I'm just playing Monopoly. That's mm -hmm. all I do. You know, I re-listened to your book on the flight over from London, and I hadn't listened to it in maybe six years. And the first time I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I thought it was a book about money. But when I, when I listened to it a couple days ago, I saw it differently. I saw it as a book about fear, about self-knowledge, about mindset, because you're yeah. just describing these people and they're, they're in this world that they don't want to, want to acknowledge that they're in. It's almost yeah. a prison in their own mind. Right. Is that what you were trying to get across when you wrote that book? Well, I don't know what I was trying to get across. I just, uh, the real, the, the fact of the matter was I created this board game called Cash Flow. Yeah. And I couldn't sell the board game. So I had to write a brochure. And the brochure I wrote was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So Cash Flow came out in 1996. And Money, I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad came out in 97. So the real fact of the matter is Cash Flow is about accounting. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a book on accounting income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow. But if you've ever taken accounting courses, there is no more course more boring than accounting. So to have Rich Dad, Poor Dad be a book on accounting and be the number one personal finance book of all times, that says something. And it, it sold the cash flow game. And today there's thousands of cash flow clubs all over the world. And the mission statement was people teaching people. You can bypass that school system because the school system will never teach you about money. The school system was designed to teach you to be an employee, which is important, or a doctor or a lawyer, a specialist, but never about money. So once I got old enough and I had already retired and I was rich and I was fairly well off, it was kind of a social conscience. I said, I have to share what I know. So that's why and it took till 1996 for the cash flow board game to come out because I could see this crash coming, which came out in 1998. And then Rich Dad Poor Dad came in 97. And um, the story goes, every publisher turned me down. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. Because they said, savers were losers. Your house is not an asset and the rich don't work for money. And so the publishers are like my dad, academic superstars, you know, they're A students in school. And um, so they turned the book down. And it took going by self-published route. You know, a lot of network marketing companies picked up the book, like Amway and those guys. And they picked up the book to help recruit because it's about financial independence. They're about the same thing I am. And then Oprah called in 2000. And then the next day I'm on Oprah and, and I went from obscurity to world famous in overnight success in 2000. And the book has been on the New York Times bestsellers for seven years until the New York Times took it off. They said it had been on too long. But as you know, I mean, most people in publishing or journalism, they're on the other side of the coin of capitalism. You know? So they don't like guys who make money. And that's like my poor dad side. So that's kind of the story. And you know, I play, I play a Monopoly in real life. Uh, I don't need a job. I don't have a retirement. I don't need a retirement. I don't want the government to take care of me. But I felt a social responsibility to teach. Mm -hmm. And that's what my rich dad did for me. 
and you said the book is about accounting, and it is an amazing book on accounting because it makes it understandable. Yeah. I took accounting yeah. in business school, and I know what you mean. It's boring. It's boring. Yeah. But it is also a book about your own fears, and I think that's why it resonates with people. Because right. you're telling right. them things they know is true. They know when they look in the mirror, they're not making the correct choices. They're not being disciplined. They're doing the wrong thing. And they know they're unhappy in, in fear their whole lives, yeah. waiting for the next paycheck. And it's understandable. You know, I, we all have fear. You know, to be truthful, we all have fear. It's just how you deal with it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Einstein said, you know, imagination is more important than knowledge, but knowledge empowers imagination. And what most people lack is real business knowledge, like accounting, you know, like debt, like taxes. You got to know that stuff, but they don't teach it in school to anybody. So, and, and then when people ask me, how did your rich dad learn this when your poor dad, a PhD, did it? And the answer is very simply, my rich dad, who's my, my best friend's father, his father died when he was 13. So his so rich dad had this family business at 13 to run. So he had to drop out of school, which was his blessing. You know, those blessings and, you know, sometimes a blessing doesn't look like a blessing, but it turned out to be a blessing. And then his teachers became his bookkeeper, his accountant, his attorney, his banker, his real estate agents. So he has what I call real teachers, not these fake teachers in school. You see, most teachers in school, they're out of ethics. They teach subjects they, don't, they themselves don't practice. You know, I had the same problem in my MBA program. I got into arguments with the marketing teacher because the guy didn't have a business. And then I got into arguments with the uh, accounting teacher because the accounting teacher didn't know accounting. I knew more about accounting than him because I actually worked in bookkeeping in my rich dad's companies. And so I'm not an accountant, but I understand accounting. So that was the end of my school years because I understood what a fake teacher is. A fake teacher is somebody who just wants a job and they'll teach anything. You know, they teach how to shine shoes if you pay them more money. But they really don't know what they're teaching. For example, my calculus teacher, I was at, went to military school in New York and um, I asked the teacher, I said, you know, it's, I'm in my third year of calculus now. It was called, it was called strength of materials. I said, am I ever going to use this stuff? He goes, no. You know, I said, why do you teach it? He says, because I get paid. I said, do you ever use it? He goes, no. And that's why, you know, I, you have to, in life, one of the things I suggest to people, you've got to find a real teacher versus a fake teacher. And a fake teacher is somebody who doesn't do what they teach. And a real teacher is doing what they teach every day. So my accountants, my attorneys, they're in it every single day. And that's how I learn, because every day I'm solving problems in my business. So I have, I have accountants and attorneys and bankers and all these people on speed dial because I'm, I'm solving problems with my team. Hmm. How, how, that's how, how I got smart. That's how you got smart. How are we doing 21 years later since this book was published? There's more information out there than ever. We've got the YouTube, we've got internet, everything. Are people better educated about money? No, they're worse off. I mean, you know, I have a, my little Rich Dad radio show and tomorrow I'm interviewing these team of, I think they're educational psychiatrists and they're, they're, the book is, their book is called Coddling of the American Mind. It's how they're making, how our school systems are making our students weaker. So in school, they have these things called now trigger effects. So you can't, as a teacher, you can't say anything that might upset the student. They don't want anything that might jar their point of view. So if I went into school, I'd be thrown out because I threaten them. I would, <laughs> you know, and, and to me, isn't school about opening your eyes and minds to new ideas? But that's now out of the system. So everybody's got to be PC, you know, politically correct now. And it's killing us. It's killing the brains of our kids. They're going backwards. But in their minds, they're more enlightened you know it might be but if i don't if i didn't have ideas that shook me i wouldn't learn anything new but now these trigger have trigger mechanisms you know like they they don't let you have peanuts anymore 
you know, so that they found out if you, you, you take peanuts away from a child, their propensity to have peanut allergy goes up. So you get out of the child, you say you can't have peanuts. So 17% will find out they're allergic to peanuts. But if you gave kids peanuts, only 3% would be allergic to peanuts. And that's kind of the metaphor the book starts with. He says, we're actually making our students weaker in school. Yeah. You did a corporate retreat here uh, about a week ago. You do it every year for the last 21 years, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or Rich Dad Headquarters. Right. Um, and you bring all your people together. And you said you started talking about something new that you didn't always have as a theme of, of your retreats. What was that? Well, this year, and we're putting it back into the business, was my success comes from spirituality, not finance. And what happened was when my wife and I started Rich Dad back in 1996, actually, we left the spirituality out. And then the corporate types came in, you know, the MBAs and the accountants and attorneys, and they tried to make it into a business. And I said, no. We're just a bunch of merry men who are kind of like Robin Hood and his gang. Are you Robin Hood? Taking no, from the rich no, and no. giving to the poor? No, no, I don't believe it. I don't believe in giving to the poor. But you're giving knowledge to the poor. Yes. That's a very big difference. You see, people say, well, why don't you give the poor money? So the only problem with that is it just creates more poor people. Give a man know. a fish, he fishes for the day, or eats for the day. Yeah, you give a man a fish, you get a lot of people who want more fish, you know? But you teach them to fish but you are the Robin Hood of knowledge because I see you giving this knowledge out and yeah. do, do the rich people cringe and say, don't tell them that, Robin? Yes, yes, yes. Don't tell people what, they, what you know. Right. Keep them poor. But you know, unfortunately, the poor, as was in the Bible, I'm not real religious, the poor will always be amongst us because it starts up here. Right, it's that fear mentality. It's, it's in their words, you know, and the words become flesh. Again, I'm not really religious. I flunked out of Sunday school also. But when they say, I can't afford it or I can't do that, they go down. They become what they say. And I meet so many people, I, don't, I can't afford it. You think I made up money? Your mom used time. to say that. Your mom used to say that. My dad. Your dad. My PhD dad, he says, what do you think I am? Made up money? I can't afford that. And my rich dad would say, that's why he's poor. Poor people say, I can't afford it. I can't do that. I don't have time. Because this is an escape. It's an escape, you know what I mean? It's easy to say, I can't afford it. Oh, I'm too tired. Oh, I can't go to the gym. You know, when you, when you could go to the gym, but no, I can't. The truth is, I'm just too lazy to go to the gym. And you play it safe and you don't introduce new right. risks into your life, and right. so. I have job security. Right, and your rich dad used to say what instead of, I can't afford it? How can I afford it? How can I do that? You know, what would it take, or why should I do that? He says, a, a question opens a mind, a statement closes the mind. See, when you say, I can't afford it, your mind shuts down, and you become what you say. You know, like, I struggle with weight all the time. You were telling me that you were on a vegan diet and all that. Yeah. You know, I, I go on a vegan diet three times a year. It's one of the most miserable things in the whole world, but I had the discipline to do it for 21 days, and then I'm back to pigging out again, you know. But the thing is, is that we become creatures of our own habits. And until we break the habit, we don't change. So I have, I, have, I have my retreats twice a year, three days. People come from all over the world, and we study together. And this time, we went back to spirituality. Spirituality, most people would, they can't believe what they're hearing from Robert Kiyosaki, that rich dad, poor dad, is, it should been, was originally about spirituality, because they think it's all about the money. It's yeah. not. Yeah. I, you know, people say, well, money is not that important to me. Then if money is not that important to you, money is not important to you. I mean, the, you know what I mean? I don't care about money. The money doesn't care about you. You know, it, the word does become flesh. Right. Or I'll never be rich. Or the favorite one is the rich are greedy. It's the poor that are greedy. You know, if you think about it, because to be rich, you have to give something. You know, you have to, I, I have to produce books and games and I... I purchase real estate, I provide housing, provide jobs and all that. That's why I'm rich. But greedy people produce nothing. Oh, no, it's the rich that are greedy. And I'm going, hey, sports fans, you know, you point a finger forward, three are printing backwards. Mm. 
I and so a, as we know, there's a big attitude problem against the rich today. I had a guest on my show recently and said, he said, poor people are selfish. Yeah. Hit a lot of people below the belt. And he said, no, think about it. These, yeah. These people are selfish. They're always complaining about their problems. They're always focused yeah. on their own yeah. issues. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Well, the way you get rich is you solve other people's problems. <laughs> right. That's how you create value. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you, know, if you could cure cancer today, you'd be a trillionaire. You'd be an instant trillionaire. Now nah, I'm just too busy to work on that. I think I'll play golf instead. Yeah. Tell me about how you bring spirituality back into a company, a corporation, or rich dad. Well, because it's a business, I can't force anybody to do anything. But we study spiritual books. Like the last book we studied was The Power of Now by uh, Tali, yeah. T-O-L-L-E. And then before that, we, you know, we, we studied those types of books. We also study finance books. But then I encourage meditation and this process called cl clearing. You know, Tali talks about we have pain bodies in our, you know, it's like maybe you're father did something to you 50 years ago. Well, that pain is still there. And meditation doesn't get to it. So there are people with the precision, it's like a laser guided to go in there and remove the mental and emotional pain. So there are processes who can do that. So at our events, we have these processors and they're made available to people. Now, do ever, is everybody participant in it? No. Right, you, you have know, to have a little faith. It doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And I, I was trained as an engineer and science told me that none of this stuff works. But, yeah. but when I meditate and I practice yoga and I do these things, yeah. I do find pain leaving my body. So yeah. again, I have to ask myself, am I stuck in that poor dad mindset of believing everything everyone tells me and not making some, own de some decisions for myself? Yeah. Well, when people ask, you know, like, how did I get on Oprah? How did I write a book with Donald Trump, now president of the United States? Not that I'm endorsing him. He's much hated. Good man, though. I want to talk about him. But, but anyway, we'll um, how could I have done that? Well, it wasn't my brain. It was, you know, Oprah had to be on the program because she's concerned also. Trump and I wrote the book together because we both had rich dads and we both are advocates for financial education. And a lot of people just hate him because he's rich or he's obnoxious. He is obnoxious. I can't give it that. But we, we didn't get together for about money because we both had rich dads who taught us how to make money. Our schools don't teach that. Our schools teach almost the exact opposite of that. So anyway, um, how does a guy like me, a little kid with no money, and it wasn't I was poor, we're very middle class, you know. I think my father was making about 20,000 a year. And when I graduated from school, from college, I was making 120,000 a year six times the amount he made. And I was 21 years old. And he goes, how'd you do that? I said, I didn't go to the same school you went to. <laughs> <laughs> you used your mind in a different way. No, it's, I just followed my heart. Okay. I went to school to be a ship's officer to sail. So I sailed all over the world. And, and back in, this was in the 60s, if you sailed into the war zone, Vietnam, which I did, you got double the pay and no taxes. So that's how I was making 120,000 a year. And I come back, my father's still making 20,000 a year. I'm making 120K. And he can't understand it because he's a poor man in mind and in soul. You know, he, he says, you, you've become like one of those rich guys. And I said, just because I have money. You know, I'm in the war zone, I'm doing this. But it violated all the core values. See, the reason, you know, as you had, was it, was it Lipton? On yeah, Bruce Lipton on my Bruce show. Bruce yeah. Lipton. Yeah. He says poverty is passed on. It's taught in your families. And middle class is taught in families. And I was really, I was really happy that, you know, he, he endorsed Rich Dad, Poor Dad on your program. Because he says, I was taught by a rich man. And so the people right now who are sitting at home <clears throat> who are struggling financially or worried about money or unhappy, they may be making a lot of money, but unhappy with what they're doing, it was probably taught to you. You know, your super ego was taught, get a job, work hard, or you'll, or you'll never be rich, or the rich are evil, or whatever. And until you change your mindset, Correct. money won't help you, right? Correct. And we see that with people that win the lottery, people that make more money, they still have the same problem right. because they have that poor man's soul. Right. 
If you're poor, you'll always be poor. That's really hard for people to understand. Yeah, the money will disappear that fast. Just like most pro athletes, you know, they make millions of dollars and what, 65% are bankrupt five years later? It's because they come from poor families. Now you tell them that, they get very angry at you. It's not, it's the rich fault. You know, it's you guys ripped me off and government ripped me off. But unfortunately, what Mr. Lipton was saying, it's passed down genetically. That's the frightening thing. So what Mr. Lipton was saying, what Trump and I are saying, and you know what uh, Jim Records and Nomi Prince and all, we're saying we gotta change what we teach our kids. Right, try to change that, yeah. that soul, that DNA, and introduce a real different mindset. Yeah, well, if they've gotta teach them, you know, as Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Yeah, but you gotta have the basic knowledge of taxes, debt, uh, financial statements and all that. If you don't want to learn it, I can't help you. So my poor dad never wanted to learn what my rich dad was teaching me. Right. You wrote books with Trump because you both were passionate about teaching this knowledge. You both had rich dads that opened your minds Correct. up to possibilities. And Correct. again, it's almost like an investor's mentality. How can I afford this? You're thinking about everything in life as an investment, invested of time, of money. You know, it's an amazing mindset to have. Um, what was that process, writing books with Donald Trump? Not one book, but two books. Right. And what did you learn from him as a man before he even became president? Well, there's no two Donald Trumps. What I mean by that is what you see on TV is who, what, what he is. He will not BS you. You know how a lot of politicians have two sides? Trump has one side, and it's the one that's present at that moment. <laughs> so the thing I appreciated about him, I always knew where I stood. I didn't have to guess He'd tell you up front. Right. Jim Rickards yesterday, he said, I know that guy. He's a kid that grew up in Queens. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's a tough guy. Yeah. Very tough. And um, Queens was not too far from where I went to school in New York. Okay. And those guys are tough. You're tough too. Yeah. We grew up tough, you know. But to a lot of people, that's offensive. That's a new thing about in school, triggering. You know, you... You can't offend me in any way. You can't scare me. Don't give me peanuts. Okay. You know. And we're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. I in hear, my opinion. Yeah, I hear this from a lot of men in your generation. You and Trump and say the political correctness is killing us. Yeah. It's killing us. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid, we teased each other all the time and all that. You can't say anything anymore. Right. You can't tease anybody because they'll sue you. You know, I'm afraid... You know, in my position, I'm never alone with a woman by myself because I can get sued that fast. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I, I you know, I, I, I don't fool around at all. I love my wife, been married 33 years. But today, you can get accused of anything, you're guilty. Right. It's, it's something sick in our society. Will this change in the next 50 years? It has to, right? Well, one of my best teachers was R. Buck, Mr. Fuller. He created the geodesic dome and all that. Yeah. And he was kind of the guy that straightened me out spiritually. And he always talked about one of the, he talked about generalized principles. And these are principles that are always true, no exceptions. So if you drop a stone on the water, the ripple always goes out this way. It's called precession. He says, there's no exception. You can't drop a stone in the water and there's no ripple. It's always a ripple. So no matter what we do, we're always creating ripples. So that's called precession. Ephemeralization is our ability to do more with less. So you look at our cell phone now, it has more horsepower than the Sperry computer 50 years ago. You know, that's doing more with less. So humans are getting more and more powerful. We have more power to us. Unfortunately, we're not evolved as human beings. You know, it's, it's horrifying. We're more antagonistic, more antisocial, you know, social media is antisocial. You know, I don't even get on the thing personally. You know, I have, I'm, I'm very controlled at what we say, not like Trump, but because it's so antisocial today. People are so antagonistic. That's the danger part. So the reason I'm speaking on spirituality, we got to evolve. You know, it means meditation, it means yoga, it means praying, it means going to church, whatever it takes. But you got to get back to calm and peace and meditation. 
what do you make of all this fighting that's going on? You know, I'm, I don't live in America anymore, but everyone tells me it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard. Horrible. It's hard going to a dinner party because arguments break they out. Fight. There's fights everywhere. We're right. fighting with each other. We're fighting with the environment. Right. How does this play out? And how do you view that? Well, that's what I was getting at. So Fuller talked about the generalized principles. One generalized principle is emergence through emergency. So when you look at the word emergency, the base word is emerge. And what Fuller says, the only way humans evolve is via emergency. Crisis. Crisis. And a big one's coming. And it's going to be, as we all know, our banks have ripped us off immensely. They're just a bunch of crooks. I don't know how they can live with themselves. But, you know, the bankers rip off trillions and they get bonused in billions. Nobody goes to jail. That's the sickness of our society. So that's why Trump and I write about financial education. It's almost like self-defense. It's almost like taking judo against our own government and our own banking systems and Wall Street. So that's why we're here with you know, Jim Records and Nomi. It's kind of self-defense, teaching people what schools will not teach us. I spoke to you yesterday and asked about the next three weeks. You're traveling all around the world. And I said, Robert, well, why are you traveling so much? And you said, because I need to let people know that this crash is coming and that these problems are out there. You feel, you feel like you have a mission to let people know about this. It's, it's a sense of that, yes. And, you know, why, is, why do I have, you know, I have bad luck too. I've, I've, I've had f financial crashes. I've had people stab me in the back. But they're all good because I grow from it. That's spirituality. Right. You know, people who are afraid of making mistakes like they teach in school, they don't ever grow. Because spirituality is there's good and there's bad. There's right and there's wrong. There's up and there's down. Most people only want to be right. They only want to be positive. Well, you can't have that. That's not reality. Your first two businesses, the, the, the wallet business was up and then failed. And your yeah. next one was up and failed. But you would have never gotten here without those failed. quote unquote bad events. Yeah. Should we stop using that word bad? Yeah. Every time, no, every time I failed, it was like, good. I said, okay, what have I learned? And the average person, the reason they're poor is they haven't failed. You know, they play it so safe. They haven't made any mistakes like they taught in school. That means they don't learn anything. That's why the school system's actually fundamentally corrupt. It's anti-education. Right. Don't make mistakes and don't ask for help. And if I didn't ask for help, you know, I have my accountants, my attorneys, my bankers and all that. You know, I go into business like a rugby team. You know, boom, boom, and we kick butt. But the average guy is standing there, oh, I'm an A student, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this all on myself, and a, and a bunch of rugby players run you over, and you go, well, they're not playing fair. Yeah, well, you're, not, you're playing stupid. You should have a team. You should have accountants, attorneys, and bankers, and all that stuff. But that's not the game I want to play. I said, then don't play the game. You know, the, the game of business is played with accountants, attorneys, bankers, I hate to say it, politicians, you know, you got to know the game. And you got to play it hard. Yeah, and you know, as, as I was saying to you, is that I love England because my favorite game is rugby. And I, I had the benefits in the 70s of playing twice with uh, Blackheath. And that was like going to, you know, almost going to heaven to be in England playing rugby and then going to Twickenham, you know, for the World Cup. And then I was in Australia to watch Johnny Wilkinson, Sir Johnny Wilkinson, beat the Aussies in the, in the most powerful rugby game ever played, I believe. It was England versus Aussie. And they went to two overtimes. And you talk about the spirit of the players coming out. There were guys falling down on the field, not because they were tired, they were cramping up. They couldn't go anymore. That Wilkinson, which I forgive him for, <laughs> kicks that field, you know, you go, but that's the game. And a lot of people would rather sit in the stands than be in the game. That's why you like rugby, because oh. they're on the field, they're, <clears throat> competing, they're competing, they're going head to head, right. it's raw. Rug rugby is a team sport, but so is soccer. The rules are different. You know, when I went out for soccer, so we mean I can't hit anybody? I think I'll stay with rugby. <laughs> <laughs> and other people are golfers, they play by themselves. And so everybody's different. So what I say to young people is you, you find your game. So my game financially 
is business, number one. Second is real estate. And that's why I pay no taxes. That's why Trump pays no taxes legally. It is a combination of business and real estate that gives us an unfair advantage over our employees because they don't know what to do. There was an article in the New York Times on the front page about a week or two ago, and it was about Jared Kushner, right? So Trump's son-in-law. And about you how- saw that same article. Yeah. And Did it, you pick it up? Yeah, I, I read it, and it was all about how- Depreciation. And yeah, he didn't pay any taxes, and his net worth was growing, and everyone's arms were up. Look yep. at this guy, he's not paying taxes. Yeah. And this is the New York Times, yeah. okay? So well, you know, considered a front runner in the news, showing us how bad this was that this entrepreneur who grew his net worth by like three times or four times over the last three or four years, and I, and I thought of you. <laughs> what Thank does you. that tell us? What do you see when you see that article? Well, the New York Times article is an employee mindset, and they have no financial education. Somebody said, Kushner has a loophole called depreciation. I go, you idiot. It's a legal, it's not a loophole. Depreciation is what the government wants us to do. 